Welcome to the Science of Community track. This is our second year, and I'm so pleased that we have an awesome lineup uh, this year. We're kicking things off with the most excellent Dr. Don Foster talking about metrics for action. Don is a leader in the metrics community for open source, um, having worked with Chaos now for, for a good amount of time, and I'm really looking forward to what she has to share with us today. Awesome. Thank you. Um, I'm going to start with a question for the audience. How many of you consider yourselves primarily a researcher? Okay. A few. How many consider yourselves primarily a practitioner? How many kind of both? How many don't like to raise their hands when asked for audience questions? Okay. All right. We got it. We're good. Um, thanks. That's helpful. Uh, before I start, I did want to just mention that the slides are already uploaded on the speaking page of my Fast Wonder blog website, which is linked right there on the slide, uh, because I do have loads of links embedded in the presentation. So you can grab the slides and you'll have the links. The focus of this presentation is on using metrics to improve project health and sustainability. Open source projects aren't static. Right? They aren't healthy or not healthy, sustainable or not sustainable. One of the advantages of using open source is that we can work within these projects to improve the health and sustainability, whether you're a practitioner, a researcher, or something in between. So that's what I'm going to focus on for this presentation. A quick thank you to the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, who funds the Chaos Data Science Initiative, along with the Linux Foundation and Ford Foundation, who also provide support for the Chaos Project. I have been in the technology industry for well over 20 years, working mostly on open source software. I'm a board member of Open UK. I'm co-chair of the Cloud Native Computing Foundation Contributor Strategy Technical Advisory Group. And while a large chunk of my career has indeed been as a practitioner, I've also spent some time on the research side. So in 2018, I completed a PhD after spending several years researching how people use mailing lists for collaboration within the Linux kernel. So for those three and a half years, I was doing full-time research. But even when I was working within companies like Intel and VMware, data has been a really significant part of my job, since I do tend to rely on data to make decisions and understand what we need to improve in our open source project work. So for the past year or so, I've been working mostly full-time on the Chaos Project, where I'm the Director of Data Science. And this role spans between research and practice. So I spend a lot of time thinking about how practitioners and researchers can use metrics to better understand how to measure and then make improvements for open source project health and sustainability. I will start with a very quick overview of the Chaos Project, for those of you who aren't familiar with it. How many of you are familiar with the Chaos Project? Ooh, I love this audience. Lots of people. This is great. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll also talk about some thoughts on how to approach metrics to improve the sustainability of your projects. And we'll look at it across four categories, responsiveness, contributor sustainability, organizational participation, and security. And then I'll wrap it up with a few final thoughts. So CHAOS stands for Community Health Analytics for open source software. We're focused on defining metrics and developing software to help people improve the health and sustainability of their open source projects. So we are an open source Linux Foundation project. We are globally distributed. We have people all over the world. Um, and I'm, I'm a little biased, but I do think we are a lovely place to spend some time and hang out. We are not focused on medical health, so people see health and they think the wrong thing. Um, not the wrong thing, just not what we do. Uh, we, we don't have any profit associated uh, with the project, so we don't have any specific mandate. We're not, um, uh, yeah, we're not doing for-profit things. And we're not only focused on code contributions. We do a lot more than that. There are loads of ways to get involved in chaos. While we do indeed love code contributions, we also love people who help us define metrics or answer questions from people who are interested in chaos. We have whole groups of people making contributions focused on community management, project management, design, diversity, equity, and inclusion. And we also love people who talk about how they use the chaos metrics by writing blog posts or appearing on our podcast. One of the easiest ways to get started 
is just to find an area of the project that you're passionate about and attend some meetings or start hanging out in the Slack channel. In particular, a lot of people start by joining one of our working groups. For the researchers, researchers uh, can't talk, the researchers in the crowd, you might be interested in joining our working groups for data science. We also have one for scientific software. For practitioners, our open source program office working group might be a good place to start. And if you're interested in diversity, equity, and inclusion, we have a working group for that. But we also have badging programs where we award events and more recently projects with diversity, equity, and inclusion badges, which is pretty cool. We have chapters. Our Chaos Africa chapter is very active. Um, they're pretty fabulous. Uh, we recently restarted our Chaos Asia chapter with Divya Moen organizing that one. And we're also starting some chapters in Latin America and the Balkans. And we have two different open source projects within the Chaos Project. We have Augur and Grimoire Lab that you can use to gather and analyze your metrics. Obligatory XKCD slide. Uh, evaluating the viability of open source projects is important because when open source projects fail, have security vulnerabilities, change their license, or run into other difficulties, it can disrupt your work whether you're on the research side or the practitioner side. For practitioners working within organizations, it's particularly important to look at the viability of any open source projects that are critical for your ability to deliver products to your customers and services, or customers and users. This could include projects or products that are built on top of an open source technology or where those open source projects are maybe integrated into your products or infrastructure. If you couldn't easily swap that product, project out um, with a drop-in replacement of something really similar, then you really should be assessing the, vul the viability of that strategic project and understand any risks that might come along with it. And hopefully, you're also contributing to the strategic open source projects that you're consuming because that's probably the best way to mitigate the risks associated with a project. If you're integrated within the community and regularly contributing, you can not only make contributions that improve the viability of the project, you're also likely to have early warning signs for any potential disruptions. So it can help to think strategically about how consumption and contribution go together and how contributing to open source projects can reduce the risks associated with consuming those projects whether you're consuming them for your research needs or within your business as a practitioner. Within the Chaos Project, we tend to look at metrics as being used for two primary purposes. There's a lot of overlap. Um, historically, Chaos has been a lot more focused on what I'm calling contribution metrics. So these tend to be community metrics designed to better understand the projects that you're participating in. And most practitioners working within open source program offices tend to think of these as outbound or upstream contributions. We have a starter project health metrics model with a collection of four simple metrics to help people get started measuring contribution. And, we, um, and these starter metrics can be used by researchers or practitioners for your project. Lately, we've also been focusing on consumption metrics, which is the second type. And these metrics are mostly related to inbound or downstream consumption of open source software that you use within your products, your services, your infrastructure, your research groups. And we have four viability metrics models that were developed by Gary White from Verizon. And we also have a starter viability metrics model uh, with a few metrics to help people start measuring the viability of the open source projects that they consume. And these collections of metrics are organized into what we call metrics models, which can be found at the link on this slide. Um, and they're designed to help you think about how you might implement a set of metrics together to better understand some aspect of open source health. People love comprehensive lists and lots of data, but when it comes to metrics, that approach really can sometimes backfire, especially for practitioner practitioners. One of the biggest challenges people have with metrics for open source projects where all of that data is just available to gather and analyze is that it can be overwhelming. We only have so many hours in the day and we just cannot focus on everything. And this is particularly true for practitioners who can't spend all day every day looking at metrics and data. Within the chaos project, we like to use the goal question metric approach with the idea that you focus first on the goals 
and what you're trying to accomplish, which helps you understand the questions you have that might be answered by the data. And only then do you move on to the specific metrics to answer those questions. Because no two open source projects are the same, this also helps you come up with the metrics that are most appropriate for the projects that you want to understand. And this approach works well, both for researchers and practitioners using open source software. Quite a few metrics tools, including the ones we have within the Chaos Project, display what I affectionately refer to as the wall of metrics. So these are pages and pages of visualizations that you can use to understand your open source project, but they require you to know what you're looking at and know where to focus your energy to gather the data that you need. And we have, within the Chaos Project, dozens and dozens of metrics, and all of them can be super useful. But which ones you focus on depend on what you want to achieve or what you want to understand. And this is why starting with your goals is so incredibly important, particularly when you have a limited amount of time available. Within the Chaos Project, we just launched a series of practitioner guides designed to be used by people who may or may not be experts in data analysis, or frankly, even experts in open source, to help them understand how to interpret that incoming tsunami of data generated by open source projects with the goal of finding ways to improve the health of the projects that they care about. And these guides are useful for anyone who wants to better understand project health and take action on what they learn from their metrics to make their projects more sustainable. We launched with an introduction guide and guides on three topics that I'll talk about in the next few slides, along with uh, security as a bonus topic because that's the next one I'm gonna work on. And we also have more guides coming soon on various topics. Now these guides are rooted in both research and practice. So I've been driving the development of the guides through the data science working group within, the pro within CHAOS. And I, as I mentioned earlier, I do have a background in both research and practice. And each of the guides has links to academic research supporting the topic, but most of the content is actually based on what we've learned from practical experience. And the guides had reviewers and feedback from a wide variety of people from both our OSPO working group, which tends to be a lot more practitioners, and our data science working group, which tends to be more on the research side. And most of the metrics used in these guides were jointly developed by people working in academia along with practitioners. And while the guides were designed with practitioners in mind, I do think they're also useful for those of us also on the research side. The guides are all MIT licensed and each guide contains a link uh, where you can find the guide in the data science working group repository. So you're welcome to, you can fork the repo, you can customize it to meet the needs of maybe your project, your organization. And, and of course, we hope people will contribute suggestions back to make the guides even better over time. Starting with the introduction guide, the introduction guide talks about how there's, there's no one size fits all approach to using metrics to measure project health. Every open source project is a little different. And metrics should always be interpreted with the needs of that project taken into account. And one of the best places to start, as I mentioned earlier, isn't actually with the metrics, but by spending some time understanding the overall goals for the project. And if the project is primarily driven by an organization or owned by an organization, you should also uh, consider the goals of that organization. But by thinking strategically about the overall goals, you'll be in a better place to decide what you need to measure to determine whether the project is achieving its goals. Open source projects, as I mentioned earlier, do generate a tsunami of data that can be overwhelming. But by focusing on the goals, you can develop a metric strategy that helps you focus on the metrics that matter most for you. One key to doing this well is an interpretation of your open source metrics. Now, the real experts are the people who are involved in the day-to-day -day work on the project. So you need to collaborate with key people from the project since they can help you interpret the metrics and any trends that are identified in ways that make the most sense for that particular project. And this is, this is true whether you're a practitioner or whether you're doing open source research. And this is particularly true of open source researchers who may not be embedded in the projects that they're researching. When deciding if something is a, maybe a problem or a concern that needs to be addressed, your contributors can help you decide whether the issue might be a temporary fluctuation instead of a real problem. 
what else is happening in that community, in that project, in that ecosystem? Was there a big conference, a major release, a vacation season, or other things that impacted people's time to make contributions? It can help to overlay these on the graph to understand their impact better. And if it looks like there's an impact, you might want to wait to see if the metrics rebound on their own after that temporary disruption before making changes. But once you decide that you need to improve in a particular area, it's important for this step to have buy-in from the community and from the project leadership before you start taking any action toward making improvements. Not having support from the project could lead to the changes being ineffective, disruptive, or even damaging for the project and for the people contributing to it. The Introduction Practitioner Guide has loads more details and is designed to get you thinking about what you might want to measure and how you might want to measure it, along with some general tips and cautions. And it's meant to complement the topics in the other practitioner, guide, would, practitioner guides, which I'll talk about more in the next few slides. And out of all of the guides, this is the one that's probably most applicable to the researchers in the crowd. Responsiveness is important. Seeing large numbers of neglected issues and change requests on a project is a red flag for me because it can indicate that they either don't have enough contributors to handle incoming contributions, or even worse, that they don't actually care about or want contributions from others, which indeed is something you see in some company-owned open source projects. Or you also see it sometimes in the scientific space where researchers sometimes open source projects for other reasons that they're just planning to use for their own research needs and they don't really care if anyone contributes. It's important for projects to respond to requests in a timely manner because a quick response can help you retain contributors who otherwise might become discouraged if they don't receive a timely response. Timely, thoughtful, and kind responses to contributors indicate that you appreciate the hard work that they put into making a contribution. Being responsive to the contributions of other people helps grow the community and improve contributor sustainability, which I'll talk about in just a minute. While quick responses are indeed important, it's also important to keep up with change requests, in particular pull requests, merge requests, and resolve them in a timely manner. Even if that response is being honest with the contributor by closing the request that's just never going to get merged for whatever reason. It's easy to get behind on incoming pull requests or change requests, and, and we all get behind sometimes. Um, that's just the nature of open source. But not addressing these contributions promptly just creates technical debt and reduces the chances that they'll ever be merged because older change requests are just going to have so many merge conflicts that at some point they become impractical to deal with. But in both of these responsiveness metrics, it's really important to focus on the trends. If responsiveness is already improving, that's great. However, if you see responsiveness declining, then maybe it's time to find some ways to improve it, including recruiting more contributors and maintainers for your project. And the Responsiveness Practitioner Guide has a whole bunch of details of ways that you might think about improving responsiveness of the projects that you care about. Contributor sustainability is an important part of assessing whether an open source project and community has enough contributors for the project to be sustained over the long term. So contributor sustainability has a large impact on overall project sustainability. There are a lot of projects with a single maintainer. Many projects, even some of the big ones, struggle to find enough people to actively participate in their projects and continue to maintain them over the long term. The reality is there, there are a lot of open source projects, lots of really interesting things to work on. And just not enough contributors. So maintainers are in desperate need for help across various types of contributions that are needed to have a successful and sustainable open source project. And if there are not enough contributors to sustain a project, this increases the risk that the project will eventually fail, which creates a variety of often significant challenges for the users and for other projects that might depend on that one. And I recommend measuring contributor sustainability because there are a couple of things I can tell you. First of all, how big of an issue is your current contributor situation? If it's like this one, you really should focus on getting a few more people 
to contribute and eventually be moved into a leadership position like maintainer, for example. You might also find that there are some people contributing more than you realized, which is the other reason that this is a good metric. This can help you think about who you can encourage to contribute more and maybe find someone who could be moved into a leadership role like maintainer or approver or reviewer. Reaching out to someone and acknowledging their work while encouraging them to do a little bit more can help quite a bit with growing your contributor base. There are loads of, or at least several communities that I've gotten more involved in because someone asked for my specific help. And sometimes, sometimes people just need a bit of encouragement. And by asking them for specific things that you know that they're good at, that makes people feel good. It makes them want to contribute. Now the catch here, and with so many metrics, is that we do not want to just think about the people who are making commits. Um, it's a good start, it's fine. Um, but you should also be thinking about how you can move people into leadership positions to be responsible for things that take up valuable time from maintainers but might not show up in your existing data. So things like documentation, community management, marketing, product management, and loads of other important roles. The practitioner guide linked on the slide has even more suggestions on how to improve contributor sustainability for open source projects. We do not always spend enough time thinking about how organizational participation impacts the sustainability of open source projects. So you should also look at organizational diversity as part of your health and risk assessments for open source projects. If all or most of the contributions are from people at a single company, what happens when that company has a shift in strategy or gets acquired or just runs out of money and goes out of business? Would the project be able to continue if the company pulled all of its employees out of the project tomorrow? These single vendor open source projects, especially the ones sponsored by some of the big companies, might not seem risky, but they can quickly become unviable after a licensing change or when everyone just stops working on the project. And this is also a risk for scientific and research software and not just for projects driven out of companies. Individual researchers, research groups, and other collections of people driving these projects run out of funding or maybe change their focus, which leads to abandoned research projects. The biggest challenge with identifying trends for organizations and open source projects is that the organizational affiliation data is almost never accurate enough to use without doing some manual cleanup. This example is actually relatively clean compared to a lot of others, but you can still see that 20% you know, of the contributors aren't matched to organizations. If most of the work is being done by people at a single organization, the project might be riskier and harder to contribute to than a project with contributions that are spread out over many organizations with no one single organization being dominant. If you work for that dominant organization, you're in a position to focus on getting contributors from some other organizations by reaching out to people you know who are using the project and might be interested in contributing. And don't be afraid to use those, those corporate relationships to help you recruit more people into your open source projects. And all of that, again, is described in more detail in the practitioner guide linked on the slide, along with some thoughts on cleaning up organizational affiliation data. Now, as I mentioned earlier, we don't actually have a practitioner guide for security yet, but uh, it's on our list to develop one, and it's uh, the one that I've just started next. And it's pretty important to think about from a project sustainability standpoint. One thing I look for when assessing sustainability is whether they make regular releases and quickly patch security vulnerabilities. You can also look at change requests as part of this assessment to see if they're making changes to fix vulnerabilities and make other improvements. And in addition to just looking at the project itself, it's also important to look at the dependencies. And the Libyear metric in particular can help you see whether a project also keeps their dependencies up to date since outdated dependencies uh, can indeed be a significant security risk. And people just tend not to trust projects with unpatched security vulnerabilities as much as they trust others, and they're more likely to adopt projects that they trust to be more secure. So in short, projects that take a proactive approach to addressing security issues and releasing fixes are likely to be more sustainable over the long term. 
As I mentioned, it's important to look at frequency of releases, including all of the releases, including those little tiny point releases, not just the big ones, because it's, it's critical that security updates and bug fixes land in a release in a timely manner where your users can actually easily get it. And appropriate release frequency for a project is influenced by the size of the project and how many dependencies it has on other projects that are also releasing fixes. So you should think about whether a project is cutting releases frequently enough to keep the project up to date and secure. Now, measuring project sustainability is a pretty complex task. Within the corporate world, we do tend to think of project sustainability in terms of viability. Is the project likely to continue to be viable over the long term? And I previously mentioned that Gary White from Verizon developed four metrics models, each one on one of the focus topics listed on this slide, along with that fifth starter viability metrics model with a smaller subset just to help people get started. And I've already covered quite a few of the metrics that are in these models, um, but I organized them slightly differently in the context of responsiveness, contributor sustainability, organizational participation, and security. But the first link on the bottom of the slide is to a three-part blog post series that Gary wrote to help understand the models and how to use them. So I encourage you to have a look at those blog posts if you want to find some other sustainability metrics that you think might be, you might be interested in using. And the second link is to our metrics model page where you can find details about all of the models. And the metrics in these models can help you further expand how you assess sustainability for the projects that you care about. Before I wrap up, let me just leave you with a summary of a few resources you might find useful. The presentation had links to specific resources, uh, so I encourage you to have a look, at, a look at those. But these links are good starting points for practitioner guides, viability, for our metrics, for the project. The project Chaos Project has tools, metrics, metrics models for measuring all aspects of project health and sustainability, not just the ones that I've talked about here. And anyone's welcome to join us. And you can find our meeting calendar, links to our community from these, these links, in particular that, that top one. So let's, let's wrap things up. The ease in adopting open source can lead people to using software without spending the time needed to consider its long-term viability. Not all open source projects are created equal, and some will be more viable than others over the long term. The success or failure of the open source projects you use can have real business implications or research implications. And when a project you rely on later becomes unviable, it can have negative implications for your users, your customers, your reputation, and your research. One of the best ways to mitigate the risks associated with consuming open source is by contributing to the projects that you use. So it can help to think about contribution and consumption together especially for those projects that are most important or most strategic for you. And the Chaos Practitioner Guide series is really designed to help you think about how you can improve those projects that you care the most about from within as you contribute to them. With that, thank you, and I will open it up for questions. This one or the other one? Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Um it's it's a hard problem, right? If it was if it was easy nobody would be in this talk and you know we'd have this problem solved um, but maintainer burnout is a real um, is a real struggle right now for for a lot of maintainers and so um, you know one of one of the things is is really for that maintainer to first of all recognize that that they are are kind of the problem and that part of part of their responsibility is to bring more people up so this is where um, this is where I think a lot of maintainers, um, approach maintainership maybe um, maybe not in the best way. So a lot of maintainers think of that role as like like Uber developer. I get to develop all the things and I get to be in charge. 
um, when in reality it's a it's a management position. And I know a lot of maintainers don't want to hear this, um, but it is indeed you are indeed managing a whole bunch of other people within your community. And part of the role of a manager or leader within a project is to bring that next wave of, of people up and to, to mentor them and to help them and to help them grow into where they can take on more of that responsibility, which can be really, really hard when that maintainer is already burning out and overworked and doesn't feel like they really have, have time to do that. Um, but it really is, it really is time well spent. And I think spending that time with people who have been in the community for a while and so who you have some confidence are likely to stick around spending time to teach that person to do something specific that takes up your time as that primary maintainer can really help offload things over time and what i one of the things that i also really encourage maintainers to think about is where they're spending their time because it's not all on development right they're spending time on documentation they're spending time on community management, they're spending time on, you know, maybe social media, they're, they're spending time in all kinds of places. And think about what other roles they could promote into leadership positions. So is there somebody that they could make a community manager or a documentation lead or, you know, to be responsible for other things within the community that take up their time that would, would help spread the load a little bit. And so this is, like I said, it's, it's not, it's not easy. It involves like really, really spending some time thinking about how they, how they spend their time and thinking about how they can help mentor other people into, into roles that could offload some of that work. Other questions? Yeah, Mike. Um, yeah, so the question was about adding additional metrics around comments and commits. Um, so we have, I think we have, we have some metrics defined that, that touch on those. Uh, we're also always looking for people to define additional metrics. Um, it might be that the, uh, the software that he's, that this person's using within, um, within the chaos project may or may not have the metrics that they're looking for because we, we define metrics and we have software and those, those two don't always, don't always match up as cleanly as, as, as one would hope. Um, so I would say like, uh, so think about whether, whether they're missing the metrics in the software or whether the chaos project doesn't just have the metric defined because we can certainly, either one of those, we can certainly fix. But I would, I would maybe back up and think about why, why they think they need those metrics um, and what they want to use them for which might help them decide whether or not those are, are really the right metrics um, because they do sound very detailed and I'm not sure, I mean, maybe there's a really good reason to, to collect them for, for something, but I would, I would spend some time thinking about what, the, what they're trying to achieve and whether or not those are the best metrics to do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and again, it comes down to your goals and what you're trying to achieve as a project and whether, whether those are, are useful for you. Yeah. Uh, Eric. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So the question was, um, in a in a funding pitch, what what metrics might you might you focus on? Um, I would I would say that depends a lot on uh, the funding organization um, because I do I do work with a few of those organizations and they're they're all looking for something a little bit different. So I do some work with the the Sovereign Tech Fund, for example, in Germany, and they're specifically looking for um, critical infrastructure projects. 
So in that case, being able to show that loads of loads of other projects depend on you, that you're used in, in critical infrastructure, and being able to justify your project based on the things that they that they care about. Um, there are other other funding organizations um, that look more at like scientific software. So like like uh, Chan Zuckerberg Institute is a little more on on that side, like the research and scientific software. So it, it really does depend on on what the what the funding request is and and how you might how you might justify that. Um, but I do think I do think in in all cases I think that um, what projects depend on on your project I think that that can be really important. I think also um, another thing that can be important in the funding pitches is to talk about how you're going to use the funding to improve the long term sustainability of the projects. Because I do see a lot of these funding requests coming in where it's, you know, they're going to fix some bugs, they're going to do some things, um, but it's not always clear how, how they're going to continue that once the funding goes away. Because this is, this is the challenge with funding, right, for open source projects. It's great that we have lots of organizations that are looking at, at and funding open source projects, but they're generally doing it, they're not doing it long term. It's not like I'm going to give you X amount of money and it's going to be spread out over 10 years. It's I'm going to give you this chunk of money, you're going to do this chunk of work, and it's going to be over in usually 12 to 18 months. And so that, that's not long-term sustainability, right? That's, that's short-term. So being able to show how you plan to use that money to make the project better and more sustainable over the long term, to the extent that you can do that, depending on what you're asking for, I think is also something that's, that's really helpful when it comes to the, the funding question. And that's a super important question, by the way. I think, I think more maintainers should be funded. Oh yeah, absolutely. There are loads of good reasons for projects just not to continue, um, and it is something that I think we need to I, we need to consider. And it's something. So when I when I worked at VMware, we had a whole we had a whole process for this. We called it uh, the sunsetting process, um, where we would basically archive projects that that no one was no one was using, that no one was interested in anymore. That may, maybe maybe we're, we weren't maintaining it. Um, the challenge is that, um, so in particular in the corporate, I'll talk about it from two sides, but in particular in the corporate environment, what you don't want is for people to find projects that are in your GitHub organization or your GitLab organization that um, have been abandoned for years and have loads of security vulnerabilities because people will look at that and be like, oh, well, that's in the VMware org. It must be, it must be good, right? And so people will just tend to trust those projects a little bit more than they maybe should. Um, so from the corporate standpoint, it's, it's really important to think about the end of life of a project. On the other side, um, companies are, I talked about this earlier, but organizations tend to be fickle, right? They're all of a sudden not interested in this thing anymore and they don't wanna work on it. Um, but if there are loads of people using it, including you know maybe your customers or just you know lots of infrastructure that depends on that project, you really shouldn't just end of life it tomorrow. You should talk to people about how it's going to be end of life, to give them some time to make that transition, maybe help them with, with transition to something else. Maybe there's another similar project that has a good, a good path to transition to. And those were, those were things that we all did. Um, we, we used kind of all of those strategies at various points in VMware. And so it is important to think about whether, whether a project is just, just done and think about a graceful way to, uh, to end of life it. And be clear that you've end of life it and that security vulnerabilities are no longer being fixed. Like that should be bold at the top of the readme. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I think individual companies do that. Ben, do you have something to add? Yeah. 
Yeah, exactly. And it, you really do have to think about that kind of on an individual individual organization basis on how you want to how you want to deal with that, or just on an individual project basis how you want to how you want to deal with it. Um, but yeah, there are a lot of a lot of people do do think about that. I think in particular, in particular, I think companies tend to be more proactive about it than than maybe individuals or smaller organizations. Okay. End of life dot date um, helps you find the end of life and, and when it was end of life to cross lots of different um, types of projects. Other questions? Yeah, Nisha. Yeah, that's a good question. So are, are any of the metrics available for anyone to look at for open source projects? Um, these metrics that are I focused on in the practitioner guides are in particular metrics that are, in most cases, relatively easy to get, whether you're using chaos software or not. So like the contributor data, you can, um, for at least for GitHub projects, you can pretty easily go into the insights tab and and see what um, what the contributor data looks like. Uh, the things like organizational data, as I said, involves a bit of a bit of cleanup and digging to understand where those people where those people work. But in a lot of cases, if it's so if it's a, if it's a massive project in a big company, you can probably install some software that does this. If you're chaos software or or something else, um, that that's fine too. But if you're you know if you're a small project. Um, you know, a lot of this you you can just sort of figure out. You can look at the you can look at the pull requests. You can look at the issues, and you can look at the responsiveness and just kind of piece that together. So you don't necessarily need like big software packages to do to do all the metrics. In a lot of cases, you can get a pretty good gut feel for what these metrics look like just by just by poking around in your project and and just looking at the data. Yeah, so the the GitHub does indeed rate limit their their API, which can make it difficult to get large data sets. Um, and that is particularly true with the REST API. The GraphQL API has much more generous uh, rate limits, and you can gather a lot more data. Um, I had one, I could kick myself, like somebody showed me the GraphQL API for GitHub years and years and years ago, and I was like, all right, that's great, I don't have time. And so I continued using the REST REST API, and I had this one script that it took it took hours to run. It just took hours, um, primarily because of, of rate limiting, and it wasn't a massive amount of data either. Um, and so finally, I was like, "All right, I'm just going to try this GraphQL thing." And and then like 20 minutes later, I had all of my data, um, and it didn't take hours and hours anymore. Um, and it was uh, actually better data than what what I had before. So I would encourage you if you're using the uh, the GitHub API to explore the GraphQL API. There's a, a tool called GraphEQL, which um, allows you to do that pretty pretty easily to get started. Other questions? Yeah. Oh, that's a good question. So, so how do you how do you look at collaboration across across multiple projects? And that that is a that is kind of a hard problem. Um, and I don't I don't know specifically of any tools that do this, but I have seen some people working on this and using kind of network analysis to um, to look at where the collaboration points are between between projects and between the people who work on those projects. So I don't know that there's an easy off the shelf. Uh, solution for that, but I would say I would say to you know to look at some look at doing some network analysis if if that's what you're interested in. And I do know that 
Grimoire Lab, or at least um, the commercial Baturgia project that's based on Grimoire Lab, which is the, the chaos tool, does have some of that network analysis uh, built in, but I'm not sure to the extent um, that, that it has that. But yeah, I would, I would look at doing some network analysis. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. So the question is, how have you seen people actually using metrics to make those improvements and how persistent have those improvements been over time? And I would say that it's, um, it's kind of hit or miss and it's, uh, it's variable depending on, on the, individual, the individual project and what, what they're looking at. And in particular, with some of the metrics like responsiveness and contributor sustainability, those, those are not things that are going to just, you do one thing and then it's gonna change forever and it's gonna be perfect for you know, the, all, all of time in the future. I would say that the, the best approach to making improvements within these projects is to do small changes incrementally and continue to measure whether or not those changes are, are being successful and then what else you can change after that. And so a lot of, a lot of what I focus on in the practitioner guide are things that create um, sustainable changes. So things like you know, improving your contributor documentations if you need to recruit more new contributors, things like having uh, issue and pull request templates to reduce the time required for maintainers to review things because things are in a more, more complete, more standardized format. So I would say I would start with, I would start with things like things like that start with some maybe some of the things that are more likely to be sustainable over time because a lot of these a lot of these changes like you you get people focused on something and it changes for a little while and then and then people just sort of forget about it you become become complacent um, and then the other thing to think about and this this is talked about in particular in the introduction guide is you know to really be careful about how you make these changes because when you're looking at something like responsiveness, just putting more pressure on those overworked, burnt out maintainers to respond more quickly is not going to help your project in the long term. It's likely to increase the burnout. It's likely to make the problem worse, not better. So really, really think about the, um, the side effects of the, the changes that you're, you're looking at making and how, how those changes might help your project, not tomorrow, but in you know, six months to a year. Other questions? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, so on the one hand, I actually don't like comparing projects to each other. So, like you know, Project X is better than Project Y based on you know metrics because projects are very, very different. But I do think that there is a lot of value in collecting some of those metrics, like what you talked about. So when when I was at uh, when I was at VMware, I came in through the Pivotal acquisition, and when I worked at Pivotal, we we had a philosophy of let's just open source everything and see what happens. Uh, which sounds great, um, but as a result, nobody knew what we had. So VMware was acquiring us, and they were like, "We, you know, no, people are like, I don't, I don't know, I don't, I don't know, I don't know what we own or what we have." Um, so, I, like, like we knew where the important stuff was, but there was there were a lot of open source assets that just nobody knew where to look for. Um, and so, I actually wrote a whole bunch of this. This was the script actually that took hours. Was the one that went through and was like, "Is there what's the license on that?" individual repository what when was the last commit date when was the last push date who made that commit so that if i have a question like are you still working on this who can i go talk to so i i did i gathered all this data about individual projects just so that i could i could do some some assessments of of what we had and what the what it looked like so i, I think there's definitely 
definitely quite a bit of value in doing that. And it's something I recommend that um, I've been talking to a lot of new OSPOs. So Sloan Foundation funded some open source program offices for universities. And so that's one of the things I've talked to several of those universities about is, you know, just figure out what you what you have and and what the state of it is. And so there, there is a lot of value in, in gathering that kind of data for sure. I think I'm out of time. <laughs>